Welcome to Core Concepts. I'm your host, James Renford Powell. And as you know, if you've been watching any of the, our shows on YouTube, or if you've been present, uh, we have people who come from all walks of life, from various religious disciplines. And uh, our simple question is, what do you believe? Why do you believe it? What are you doing about it? In other words, how did you come to this belief system? And how is it manifesting in your life? Today, this show is coming to you from Unity Christian Church on McCorkle Road in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, we will be taping our shows here uh, from now on. This is our home base, except for when we are interviewing live at um, uh, the facilities of some of those that we are our guests on our program. Today, our guest is is Reverend uh, Eric Ovid Donaldson. Reverend Eric Ovid Donaldson. And Reverend Eric is uh, a ordained minister originally with Reverend Ike, United Evangelical Christian Foundation. And we're going to be talking to him a little bit about his belief system and how he came to be here. Actually, I know his name as well as I, I know my own. But uh, anyway, Reverend Eric, welcome to the show. I'm glad to have you with me on, on Core Concepts today. Good to be with you. Reverend Ike was quite a famous man. Wasn't yes, he? absolutely. Yeah. A pioneer yeah. in prosperity. He really uh, shook the foundation of many churches in terms of uh, this idea of poverty being pious. And uh, he said, oh, no, no, no. Uh, I don't, I, he just could not get into uh, an idea of an opulent God and, and, and a God with abundance um, uh, requiring poverty uh, as a way of quote unquote getting into heaven by and by. So uh, through his studies, uh, many, most of which was very metaphysical, uh, he began to develop uh, into the uh, icon uh, that uh, he's known as being today. Well, he had a, a, a large church in New York. Yes. And then did he have something on the West Coast as well? Uh, yes. The, um, yes, the West, uh, the West Coast uh, is uh, where his son, Xavier, mm -hmm. uh, has his church. Uh, and then uh, I believe he also has uh, a church in South Carolina as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but he spent a lot of time uh, on the road, so much so that his uh, Sunday service was in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that reasoning uh, came when he tried to get back for his Sunday service one Sunday morning, and he said, "Oh no, that won't do." Now, was this a was this a, a separate denomination? I mean, did he did he create it? I mean, it wasn't uh, it wasn't part of any religious association or church association. That's correct. He wasn't a part of any. Uh, in fact, he. He created his own United Evangelical uh, Christian Association, Christian Evangelical Association, and uh, he uh, uh, he always would tell me uh, that he is Metacostal, uh, meaning that he had a Pentecostal Pennings uh, um, upbringing, perhaps, uh, but much of what he he uh, he talked and spoke was very metaphysical. Mm -hmm. How did you get from Detroit to New York here? How did you make this connection? It was actually via Chicago. <laughs> and uh, one day, um, I, I was a member at, at Christ Universal Temple uh, in Chicago, Illinois, uh, Reverend Dr. Johnny Coleman. Mm -hmm. And one day in Chicago, I was in my apartment uh, Saturday night, well, Saturday night live on. And I get a phone call. And I was like, who's calling me this late at night? And when I picked up the phone and said, hello, uh, the person on the other side said, uh, hello, this is Reverend Ike. Now, up to that point, the only time that I knew of Reverend Ike was when my mom took myself and my sister in Cobo Arena in Detroit, Michigan, downtown Detroit, to see Reverend Ike. That was years ago. That was at least 15, 20 years ago. And so, uh, when I heard on the line, 
Reverend Ike, I thought it was a prank. I said, no way, no way. What is Reverend Ike calling me about? And so I said, okay, you've got the wrong number. And I hung up the phone. And the phone rang again. And I said, what? He said, it's really Reverend Ike. And so when I heard the tonation of that response, I knew that indeed it was Reverend Ike. And then he explained that my name came uh, to him from a dear friend of mine who was also a member of Christ Universal Temple. And he thought that I would make a great minister. Would I be interested in interviewing? And I asked him, well, how soon do you want me to come and interview? I was on the plane the next morning and I went to New York and I received the job. I was his youth minister. And that's how that all got started. And I learned so much from him. He was one of the most sagacious, tenacious, dedicated souls that I've ever seen. He was really about the principles that he espoused. And I saw another side of Reverend Ike that most people did not get to see because of the position that I held with him. So I got to see his pastoral side, his fatherly side, uh, his church side, uh, that side that was, wasn't on stage, that side that wasn't in the Rolls Royce. Evangelical. Yes. That it, it was, out, out evangelizing Yes, and it was really, he was, he was the real deal. He, he really was. Uh, uh, people, a lot of people, because of the subject matter that he, uh, that he talked about, uh, did not take him seriously. But as we all know now, uh, it was because of the trail that he blazed that the topic of prosperity is readily discussed. Uh, in churches all over the world. Well, at the point that he called, though, you were you were working with Johnny Coleman with her school there. Yes, with with her church, Christ mm -hmm. Universal Temple. She uh, she was first ordained a Unity uh, minister right. and then uh, departed that uh, and created her own her own foundation, Universal Foundation for Better Living, and her church was one of the largest New Thought churches in the world. So it really wasn't a doctrinal difference. It was basically to do her own thing. That's, that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. And she has a school too, didn't she? Yes, the Johnny Coleman Institute. Now did you attend that? Were you? I did. I did. And that was for a time. That got interrupted by the call from Reverend Ike. Reverend Ike. And so a little later on down the line, uh, I was invited uh, to come back to school and get my ordination with Johnny Coleman and the Universal Foundation for Better Living. So you did both of those? I did both. And how long were you in the youth ministry there? Very, very short period of time, uh, less than a year. Was there a reason for that? You don't, did you want to get back into a, a pastoral thing or? Uh, no, I got fired. Mm -hmm. I got fired because uh, uh, there were, uh, I came in uh, with two other individuals. And uh, long, long and short of it, uh, all three of us were fired at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then Reverend Ike's, Reverend Ike's wife, uh, uh, according to Reverend Ike himself, uh, talked with Reverend Ike and said, I think you threw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was that in his haste to clean house, uh, he cleaned me out. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, and perhaps I was the one that should have stayed. How did you like that, working in the youth ministry? Uh, I liked it a lot. Uh, the energy of the youth was really what I liked the best. Now we'll get to it a little bit later, but with your current position as senior pastor for Unity Christian Church, you, you um, I think you were planning some things to do with youth ministry even now, are you not? Uh, yes, we really want the church to grow, so uh, we, have to, uh, we have to learn how to do what is called sacred safety. We want this to be a place where uh, children can grow and learn uh, these universal spiritual principles uh, that we espouse. Uh, everywhere I go, especially those who are new to 
uh, this belief system uh, we call New Thought or New Thought Christianity. Uh, once they understand it, one of the first things they say is, wow, if I had known this when I was growing up, if I had known this when I was six years old, eight years old, ten years old, well, I got the opportunity to grow up in New Thought, and, and it worked well for me. Uh, so I really desire to create a space here at Unity Christian Church uh, where, the, where other children here in the Memphis area will have the opportunity to experience what I experienced growing up in uh, this type of, of belief system uh, that we call New Thought, where people will, where they can understand that they can do anything that they set their mind to, and how to set their mind to doing it. How to create, to, to get in an idea, and create around it, and manifest something of their dreams. Uh, I think that's something that we really need to so, so foster in our children. So your mother was already involved in New Thought. My mom and my dad. Because most people who are in New Thought now seem to me to be sort of the walking wounded. They've all come out of a very harsh condemnation type of Christianity and are, are feeling good here, but it doesn't, there are not so many that have grown up in it, New Thought. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I see a lot of people who uh, might have grown up, um, whether it was Catholic or, or some other denomination, and uh, just as you say, it's something harsh about it uh, that turned them off, and they have been seeking something that was more loving, uh, more nurturing, uh, more positive in the manner of, of its thinking, uh, uh, something that would uh, that was subtle or looked for the, um, I call it the subtlety of spirit, um, utilizing prayer and meditation, uh, calming down the busyness of the world, and really getting in touch or in tune with oneself. That's what a lot of people are attracted to when they come to New Thought. I uh, have noticed among New Thought ministers, uh, very few who have been so forward with the electronics and, and uh, uh, video work and, and uh, all the stuff that you've been doing with your live streaming of the services here and your Skype lessons and all that. Where, how did you come into that area? That's a part of my giftedness. I, I can't take, I cannot take, well I could, but I'm not. I'm, I can't take uh, 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 I think that's something that God has instilled in me. I, I, uh, I don't know how I am able to uh, connect so easily and readily to, uh, to those types of, of technology. But I think it has something to do with my giftedness. It has something to do with my purpose, something to do with what I'm supposed to, to leave. Uh, here at Unity Christian Church and, and to work with through my ministry. Uh, I love technology. I'm, I'm a techno geek. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've got how many CDs and DVDs that you've got out there? I've got uh, some, but tell us a little bit about that. Hi. Uh, quite a few. I, I, I look to package uh, some of the sermons uh, that I have, uh, whether they be here or on the road. Uh, so they're readily available, and I, I love to do that. That's, a, again, part of my giftedness. I, uh, I came out of college uh, not even thinking about ministry. I came out of college, out of the College of Communications at Michigan State University. So you were studying in communication? Yes, yes, but for advertising and marketing, uh, I had that's no... That's what churches do, advertising. That's <laughs> what they do. That's what they do. So, uh, so it wasn't far off, uh, but uh, my mind at that time was far off from, from being a minister of any sort. Uh, although people saw that in me from day one. And so uh, my, uh, my love for packaging, marketing, uh, advertising, promoting, uh, is uh, it, that's where my creativity flows. Uh, so taking uh, uh, taking a sermon and packaging it into a series, uh, such as the Gethsemane, Gethsemane experience, or uh, or uh, 
there's one called Imagine That, which is all about the gift of imagination and how to utilize it to get the, the good that you desire. Uh, there, uh, there are several of them. There's one on forgiveness, uh, which uh, I think is probably one of my best offerings. Uh, because we all need to learn how to forgive so that we can get over it and get on with it. But how do you do that? And that's what's so good about New Thought. That's what's so good about what we do. Uh, we not just tell stories of how others do it, but we look at those stories and we pull out of those stories the principles, the ideas, uh, that uh, the, uh, the manner in which uh, one has forgiven and we can put it in a package that allows people to step by step apply it in their lives so that they can then experience what is experienced in the stories that we all know and love and so yes we know about Jesus yes we know about the Christ yes we know about all these wonderful biblical characters but until we are able to take the the juice out of it and really apply it in our lives, then it's just the story. And I think that's one of the, the things. The Sunday school pablum. That, that, that's all it is. <laughs> that's all it is. And it should be so much more. Uh, during Christmas, there's a saying, I know you've heard of it. Uh, if uh, Jesus uh, or if Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem be born, if not born within thee, thy soul is forlorn. Well, it's not just for Christmas and it's not just about Jesus, but it's about all of spirituality. Having someone else's experience is nice as far as it goes, but having your own experience, oh, there's, uh, that's where the living comes in. Now, so you, you leave disappointed from, from a youth fellowship there in New York and you go back to Chicago. What did Johnny have you doing then? Well, uh, Johnny had me a uh, platform chairperson, as a, a platform chairperson for her Sunday services. And that was really wonderful. Uh, while I was there, uh, I got an opportunity to meet someone. Chicago is an incredible place for, for notables. I met a gentleman by the name of Father George Clemens. And Father Clemens and I just had a bond with each other. We just uh, when we talked with one another, it just clicked. I think it was more because of him than it was for, for, for me. He's just that easy to talk to. And he had an, an organization called One Church, One Child. He was the first Roman Catholic priest to ever adopt a child. And he then started this movement to get faith communities to uh, adopt children. And because of that, over a million uh, adoptions were finalized. And he wanted me to participate in that. But he had two other ideas that he put into play that had the same type of premise. One was one church, one addict. Because he said, look, if this works for uh, foster children, Maybe it'll also work for recovering addicts. Recovering addicts need support. Maybe the faith community can support recovering addicts. And that was very successful. And then he had one for ex-offenders. Those coming out of prison need support. Maybe faith communities can be the ones to support them. And so he had me work on those two. He had me work on one church, one addict, and one church, one inmate. And that was really enjoyable. So I spent a lot of my time working as his national director, his national executive director. Was the attraction of coming to Unity Christian in Memphis to actually function as a full-fledged pastor? Or was that, uh, was that something you already had experienced? I've al I had already been a, an associate pastor uh, in uh, Baltimore. I had also been a director of three study groups, uh, but I had never been up to this point a, a senior pastor uh, of a church. Uh, so that was, uh, that was intriguing. But I think more intriguing to me 
was the opportunity to serve, the opportunity to take what I had learned over the years. And, and by this time, I had a lifetime of new thought and uh, had been in ordained ministry since 1994. And here we are now. Uh, wow, it's been 20 years. My goodness. So we'll talk a little bit more about what your vision is for UCC here later, but I want to get into, now you've, you've published a book. Tell us a little bit about your book. I mean, I know it's a co-op type of book, but tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I, I love this book. It's called Spiritual Principles for a Prosperous Life. And it's a collaboration of various ministers uh, I, that I have the opportunity to call my friends. Uh, one of which just made her transition. Uh, she was one of my mentors through the Universal Foundation for Better Living. She was the president, the Reverend Dr. Mary Tumpkin. You talk about a professor of, of Bible, and uh, the knowledge that she held was just absolutely incredible. So when I got the opportunity to, to actually uh, do a, a book with her, I jumped at the chance. And so did nine other people. So uh, we decided that we would split up the chapters. And each chapter would, would talk about uh, a certain or particular spiritual principle uh, that somebody could apply uh, and, uh, and have the kind of life that really goes farther than just money. By spiritual principles, if we're really talking about uh, wealthfulness, we're talking about health, well-being, we're talking about abundance, fruitfulness, uh, doing the things that you love, uh, living your making as opposed to making a living or an existence. We're talking about life lived fully and completely with purpose, uh, a vibrancy, those types of things. And that's what you find in this book. Uh, each chapter is really very good. Now your chapter is? My chapter is the one on hoarding money, the perils of hoarding money. And it's based upon uh, that wonderful uh, parable that everybody knows of the three people who are given a, a certain amount and what they do with it. Uh, and I took that and I also took an understanding of what hoarding and put the two together. And it really came out good. I'm very proud of what I was able to offer. There, there's so much to these parables. In fact, that particular one, it's real interesting to look at what the reward was. A lot of people think of a reward, you know, going someplace and, and basically as a glorified retirement and mm -hmm. doing nothing. But it's interesting that the uh, reward was more responsibility. That is so true. That people seem to forget that the one that didn't do anything took everything was taken from that person and given to the others. So that is a real, um, we see a little bit of that today, don't mm -hmm. we? Um, you know, they say that uh, those that have not will have less and those that have some will have more. Um, if we continue to, to do, why is that? What is he really saying? Is he saying that that's just the way of the world? No. What Jesus was really saying there is that, look, there everything, it works by principle. And so there are principles that those that are, are gaining are applying. And those that aren't gaining, they're not applying principle and therefore they're going in a different direction. Uh, that's all. Uh, it's a very absolute uh, concept. All right, so we've got books and we've got tapes and we've got pastoral, uh, but you are also conducting healing workshops. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, that that's my love. That's my real love. Uh, pastoring is, is really special, uh, but healing, uh, something with the mystery of that, the uh, the metaphysics of that, that really, for lack of a better term, turns me on. I think that that uh, is where my creativity is the best. Uh, that's where I've seen demonstrations that boggles the mind. Uh, and it really is a, a humbling experience uh, to have a group of people with you 
And then out of that group of people, you are seeing di diabetes reversed. You're seeing uh, uh, people's relationships mending. You're seeing oh, uh, ears popping open from people who have been deaf for years. And uh, to see this and to understand that it's not because of uh, something, something a la Benny Hinn or something of that nature, which is fine, but it's from the principles that you are teaching the people and they are grasping those principles and having an experience of them. That's something different. And so uh, for me, uh, I've done about 27 of those healing workshops thus far. And I, I have another one on the books for 2014. So it, it's not in the same realm as, say, energy work, uh, like with Reiki or Healing Touch or Qigong or any of this sort of thing. This is more to do with the changing their way of thinking, the mind, the, the it, it reminds me of Phineas Parker's Quimby. Yes. Who, where a lot of uh, Christian scientists, a lot of things came from him because he would sit down and literally talk somebody well. Yes, exactly. And essentially that's what we're doing. All I'm doing is instructing people. I'm telling people the principles that were espoused through unity principles espoused through new thought and as they are doing as they are getting it then I say okay let's give an example let's have something experiential around it and so I, I create a an opportunity for that uh, maybe a little exercise and during the exercise these things these openings are occurring and that to me is proof positive that, that's so metaphysician-like. That's proof positive that the things that uh, are being espoused are true. If you can apply them and they are working, and in this instance, most cases, very, very quickly. Can I, can I share a story? Sure. There was a story, uh, something true, it was very true, it happened, it happened not long ago it was the sixth healing workshop, and a friend of mine came just to support, didn't think anything of it, knew me from way back when, and we went through the first night of the healing workshop. And she, and there was a, an exercise where we partnered up with people that are in the room. And she partnered up like everybody else. And when she got home, she was in excruciating pain. What she did not tell anybody is that she had been masking an autoimmune disease that is very rare and there weren't anybody around her area that knew how to handle it. And so, uh, in fact, she told me that the only person, the only doctor that knew something about it was actually two and a half hours away from where she lived and the waiting list was two years long. And so she just learned how to, how we say, grin and bear it. Well, but she was grinning and bearing it. But when she went to this healing workshop, it got worse. And so in her mind, she's saying, how could this get worse? This is supposed to be a healing workshop, and I'm in excruciating pain. And so she got angry. She said, wait until I get back there tomorrow. I'm going to tell Reverend Donaldson a thing or two about his healing workshop. And so she gets back to the healing workshop. And I'm in preparation, so I'm unavailable uh, for her. But the only person, she's got to tell somebody, because by this time she's not only in pain, she's seething about it. I mean, steam out of the head seething. And the only person she could think to talk to about it was her partner from the night before. So she gets her partner and she sits her down and begins to tell her story. And by the time she was finished with her story, her partner stopped her, put her hand on her hand and said, I know that disease very well. I'm a doctor. I didn't tell you that last night and I treat that, that symptom. I know how to handle it very well. So don't worry, we got you covered. 
That's what I'm talking about. By right of consciousness, she was able, this, this is healing, she subconsciously attracted the very person that she needed to see in order to treat her disease, her condition. And she had to experience the pain so that she could tell somebody so that the healing could begin. Unbelievable. Little things like that happening throughout the healing workshop. It is absolutely amazing. And which is really the, the law of attraction in, in full play. A lot of people think of the law of attraction as being uh, attracting wealth and so forth. But also, I mean, the real underlying purpose is the inner being drawing to itself the experiences it requires in its process of evolution and unfoldment. So this, was, this is a classic case of, the, of that taking place. Now you don't, you don't, um, uh, a lot of ministers and so forth are a little bit leery of going abroad and going into other religions and so forth for things, but you're fairly open on this. I think you've spent some time even in India. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I have, and I tell you, that was an opportunity of a lifetime. Now, it was this past, uh, past September, October, I got an opportunity to go up on Mount Abu, and Mount Abu is, has an elevation of about 4,500, 5,000 feet. And uh, it was really a very special. It was with a, an organization called the Brahma Kumari. And I was invited for uh, a discussion on meditation. So I said, this is great because I, I really want to learn more about meditation. And, and there is a component of uh, new thought that speaks to meditation, prayer and meditation. We call it the silence. It's where you get silent or quiet or still, and then you allow the, the spirit to, uh, to speak to you and however that, that is for you. It might be in words, it might be in uh, you know, a tingle in your, on the top of your head or, or uh, something of that nature. Uh, however you, the spirit speaks with you. Well. I said, well, I've got to learn more about this. This might be interesting. And, and you don't always have to go to Israel to learn about something that is spiritual. Spirituality is something that has been expressed and experienced all around the world in so many different ways. And to, for me, just to, uh, just to limit myself to Christianity uh, doesn't seem to be... Uh, doesn't seem to be the thing that one wants to do. I, I want to see Christianity in the context of other spiritual uh, endeavors as well, uh, and vice versa. Uh, I want to see other spiritual uh, endeavors in the light of Christianity. And so, uh, this is a great story. What happened was, while we were preparing to get to India, we learned that the airport that we were flying into was about uh, seven to 10 miles away from, uh, from Gandhi's ashram. Well, you don't fly halfway around the world and not see Gandhi's ashram uh, if you get the, an opportunity to go there. Uh, if you're this close, you know, that's almost like around the block. That's down the road, down the way. And so uh, my travel colleague and I made an arrangement to, to go and walk in the footsteps of Gandhi to see where he would do his meditation as a part of our trip. After we descended from the mountain, that would be the place we would go before we would get on a plane and start heading back to the United States. Little did we know that the day that we had arranged to go to the ashram was his birthday. It was Gandhi's birthday. It was a national holiday. People were from, coming from all over the world to celebrate this man for his accomplishment. And just the most amazing experience to see so many people from all over the world on one accord acknowledging how this man mastered himself so in order to free a country. Just absolutely amazing. And so while I was up on the mountain, I learned about meditation, a type of meditation called Raj meditation. It's more of a meditation of the mind, of thought, 
as opposed to meditations where you get contort your Contem body. Or, oh, contemplative meditation. It's a contemplative meditation, exactly. And so uh, we studied that that is right in alignment with what we teach and preach and espouse in New Thought. Uh, so I felt very comfortable with that. And then following that, we get to share uh, with the rest of the country uh, a, an honor of, uh, of Gandhi and, and what he did uh, through his spirituality. It was an absolute incredible experience. Uh, just thinking about it and talking about it, I, I feel myself levitating <laughs> right now. Uh, just getting lighter, uh, just thinking of the experience. Well, we expect to link up here so that people can go from our site, Renford Broadcast Network, to different guest sites. So we'll get some information on that. But I want you to go ahead and give some contact numbers if you can. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, your vision for UCC and then open the, the floor for questions. Okay. What, what uh, if they want to get the book, if they want to contact you at UCC, let's, let's give the viewers uh, uh, some contact numbers. Okay, we'll do, no problem. If you want to get in touch with me, like phone to phone, person to person, call 901-654-5634. That's 901-654-5634. Now, when you call that number, it's going to, uh, that number is what's known as a Google number. So uh, you can not only call that number, but you can also text to that number as well. And I encourage people to text the word lift me or the words lift me to that number to subscribe to a text message that I send out uh, almost daily. We call it the lift me text messages. And that's to get to receive a, an encouraging word. Uh, we send out over uh, 300 or close to 300 text messages nearly every day uh, around Memphis and around the nation. So if you are technically savvy and you, you got a smartphone or you have unlimited text messages, this is a nice way to keep mindful of the goodness of God. So you can text lift me to 901-654-5634. You can also, if you are on the if you're on the web, you can visit www.unitychristianchurch.info and you'll get a summary uh, that is very compatible with mobile phones and tablets of everything that we are doing here at Unity Christian Church and about my other ministries and offerings as well. You got that 30 minute show daily also. Bible yes, yes, Bible by phone. Bible by phone, we, we, I love Bible by phone. In fact, some of the people that are on Bible by phone are in the audience. A shout out to them, I love them. They get on the phone with me at 12 noon central time, Monday through Friday for 30 minutes and we talk about the Bible. We're going from Genesis to Revelation and working on everything in between. We take a passage, a scripture, a verse every single day, Monday through Friday, and we break it down. And then on Friday in particular, we have what's known as Free Will Friday. So we recognize that not everything spiritual is caught in the canon of the Bible. There are many wonderful things outside of the canon of the Bible as well. And so you can ask anything, whether it's in the Bible or out of the Bible, and we will discuss it on that day. And so uh, that helps to, to, to stir it up a little bit. Uh, there's nothing that is out of bounds, nothing that is outside of the, well, it's all outside of the box. We get rather, rather radical sometimes because there are some things, so many things that we don't know about the Bible because we perch it way up here and we often look at it without putting context around it. We put the context around the Bible so that we can look at it in its proper perspective. And so if you really want to learn more about the Bible, maybe more than you want to know about the Bible, 
then that's what you want to uh, partake. Now your services are live streamed too, are they not? How, yes. they, how would they watch that? Yes, they are. You can go to www.unitychristianchurch.info or .us and look for the live stream button. And that live stream button will give you all the information that you need. Just follow the instructions and we'll see you Sundays at 11 a.m. All right, now we, we are running down on time a little bit and I, wanna, I want you to take just a moment and address uh, viewers about what your uh, vision is for Unity Christian and then, we, then I want to let a few people ask some questions if we've got. So don't go too long on it, but tell us a little bit about what you got in mind. Sure, happy to. Uh, we, we are great teachers here at Unity Christian Church. Wonderful, wonderful principles that we espouse. And so we need to focus on getting that word out. We look at the Bible differently in a way that most people do not. We put food for thought and substance to, um, to the Bible in ways that other people do not. And so part of this vision that I have for Unity Christian Church is to set us up so that we can reach more people with the principles that we have espoused since the late 1800s with Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. If they take these principles and apply them, apply them with where they are in consciousness, then they will find themselves living a better life. And so we want to use the technology. We want to be on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. We want to connect with people that are inside of Memphis and outside of Memphis. And we want to operate on the global platform. And so we want to Skype people in that have wonderful techniques for us to, to you know, raise our consciousness and spirituality. Uh, we want to get people on our flat screen televisions and, and speak to them uh, and together collectively. And we want to be able to do the same there. We have a collection of people here and a collective of people around the world. And so taking us from just being uh, the little church on the hill to being the little church with the big uh, reach. We want to be able to reach as many people as we possibly can. Do we have anybody in the studio audience that would like to ask a question? We have a few minutes left. Have you tried um, inmate, uh, one church, one inmate, one church, one child in this area since you've been here? I have not. I have not, and with good reason. Uh, I've been, uh, as a part of my being here, uh, I have agreed to study to become an ordained unity minister. And that's going to take some time. That's a, a four to six year plan. And so I've been concentrating on that. Uh, it's very important. It'll be my third ordination. How many hours a day do you have to devote to that? Uh, more than I, I choose to want to, but it's <laughs> important. Uh, I much rather would like to be knee deep in, uh, in the ministry. Uh, but because of what I need to do for staying uh, with the ministry, uh, I have this has to take precedent. Uh, once that gets taken care of, then we can look at uh, the needs of, of Memphis. We can look at uh, the infant mortality rate. We can look at uh, ex-offenders. We can look at uh, 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 single mothers, uh, which we have looked at a little bit. Uh, but we can go and partner with people who are already doing it uh, and, and bring our understanding of truth to that so that people who may not have heard this truth in the way that we espouse it can look at it and, and see if it fits uh, their life design. Any other question? Uh, yeah, contemplative meditation. Yes. Could you expound on that? Contemplative meditation, that's a good one. Contemplative meditation is really all about understanding yourself as soul. This is the way that they explained it on the mountain. That we do not have a soul, but we are soul. And once we understand ourselves as soul, 
And I, I describe soul as uh, that awareness of oneself as spirit. To what degree are we aware that we are already one with spirit? And that's what the soul deals with. That once we are aware of that, then spirit opens up for us to the degree that we are aware. So your meditation helps you to keep in mind your oneness. Uh, Jesus would always say, the Father and I are one. And it is out of that understanding, out of that space, that he was able to do all that he was able to do, all of the miracles, all of the wonders, all of the works that he was able to do. And so this meditation allows one to find peace and joy and happiness and protection and comfort all in that space of being one. But it starts with contemplating and understanding ourselves as being soul. Now you have plans for another book. What will that book be? Ooh. I really want to do a book on healing. Uh, the healing workshop that I've done uh, has been uh, a, a wondrous, uh, wondrous thing. And people really need to know more about those healing workshop experiences. So I really would like to compile those experiences and some of the techniques uh, and put it in a book that people can use, perhaps as a workbook, but also uh, something that can encourage them. Uh, uh, that's, that uh, healing indeed does happen in the world. Do we have another question? Well, I want to thank you, uh, Reverend Eric, for being with us today on Core Concepts. And we want to thank you for being with us also. This show is sponsored by the Institute of Applied Metaphysics and the Church of Revelation and Unity Christian Church here in Memphis now. And I want to thank you for being here and be sure and go up uh, to the Renford Broadcast Network and take a look at the six sections that are up there. Not only do we have over a year of shows of core concepts, but we have the Bookman Show, that's a local television show that I do, and uh, the Laws of Material Wealth Personal Development Program. One, the first DVD is available, so you get some idea of that. That's a book, a workbook, four DVDs and 54 weeks of support material and online coaching. And um, also there is the Renford Theater where you can link to movies that you might have heard about like The Secret, Cirrus, What the Bleep and others. You can, you can link through there and get it. Also audio books and music with meaning is, is also on that site. So I want to welcome you uh, and encourage you to go visit there. And thank you very much for being with us this week on core concepts.